one of the essentials as children growing up is to know what their boundaries are. You know, if you've had small children, I've been blessed with six children, is that boundaries are good, that the stove mustn't be touched. It's very hot. In fact, one of our grandsons recently burnt his hand on our wood stove, inadvertently, not realising it gets so hot. When we cross the street with our children, we let them know that there's a certain way to cross the street. Look to the left, look to the right and take good care. There are rules for safety. And so we teach them and they know and they learn and they remember. And, you know, the risk of falling prey to the unknown consequences of something that went drastically wrong because you did something that was... You broke some rules. You crashed somebody. You know, when you see a car accident, you think, what happened? How could these two cars collide on that piece of road? It's a beautiful, well-engineered, safe piece of road, and yet two vehicles crashed. And you recognize that somebody did something, whether it was inattention or playing with a mobile phone or, or whatever the circumstances, certain rules or certain laws were broken. Many times for the young men, it's speed. I'll always like my hot rods and muscle cars, but the risk when you're driving one is to break the rules. And as a small child, I remember my dad counselling and guiding me as to what the consequences might be of everything we say and all that we do. And I remember that. And within the body of Christ, the broader body of Christ, I wrestle with what I hear sometimes, that the Ten Commandments have been done away, the law is done away with, And nothing about the call to obedience, the call to total transformative surrender and obedience. And the probably the reason why we don't like the word obey or obedience is that we think in terms of the local colloquial terms such as a dog obedience school. We take a dog and we make him obedient to our commands. I also think of horse trainers. They take a wild stallion and break the spirit of that horse until it is compliant. It knows how to step. It knows what to do. And as free agents, and we treasure most of all liberty and freedom and freedom of conscience and freedom of thought and, and c- capacity to be creative to the utmost capacity of what God has given us, this idea of obedience sometimes speaks within the Christian circles as legalism, earning salvation through robotic mechanisms that allegedly win favor with God. I want to talk a little bit about that because you and I are familiar with biblical terms such as grace and mercy and joy and justice. And grace is a very powerful word and I Know that you and I are saved by grace through faith and not of works. The gift of eternal life is free. But what's our response to that? I want to talk a little bit about that today, and I hope it's encouraging and strengthening. Because John talks about what Jesus spoke about, lawlessness. In other words, living a life with scant regard for the words of God, the heart of God expressed in his Ten Commandments, or generally speaking, the law. First John 3, 4, John says in his letter, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So John gets this idea of living a life outside of, of the mechanisms and the counsel and the guidance of God. Gentiles do that by nature. We'll look at that scripture in Romans shortly. But listen to Jesus in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So in other words, there's a, a talk is cheap. What you do to back up your talk is what counts. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, So these are people who recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And they did. And they confessed the name of Jesus and demons were cast out and all kinds of miracles occurred. 
And you would think that I'm on the right side of history because the power of Jesus' name is manifested in the words uttered on behalf of somebody who is struggling. But there's more. There's something more deeper that Jesus, the Lord, looks at. Jesus then says, Then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. What? What sort of... Jesus says, I don't know you. You're not of my fold. Depart from me. And this is what Jesus had against them. You workers of lawlessness. So even in Jesus' day, and his prophetic words of those who'd call him Lord, were those who didn't see willing obedience as a prerequisite in fulfilling and responding to the grace given to us. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24 when he talked about the fall of Jerusalem and those things that would precede his return? Verse 12, And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. In other words, yeah, the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. Very dangerous statement to make. Lawlessness will increase. And you see that in our Western societies. We grew up, at least I grew up in a a culturally Christian country. And I believe the USA is much the same. I remember driving through, through Kansas and Ohio and Oklahoma and other Bible Belt states. I liked that area. I really liked the people I met. I felt that the the grace and the strength of America lies in her country peoples who still have vestiges of who God is. I saw a Baptist church in every corner in some of those cities, which is very encouraging because Australia is less, more secularized right across our demographic. It just is. And I want to ask the question generally about this lawlessness. I know we live in an increasing lawless society when we're talking about God's law. We legislate abortion as being legal. We legislate redefining what marriage is. And so lawlessness against the standard of God is, um, is evident there. But I'm talking about lawlessness within the body of Christ. It's easy to, to see the challenges of society around us. 1 John 3, 4, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And Paul elsewhere talks about, I wouldn't have known what sin is except by the law. Thou shalt not covet. And he uses that example out of the Ten Commandments. And um, the New King, the King James Version of John's statement in 1 John 3, 4, says, whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of of the law. And I think sometimes the idea of Christian obedience to God's commandments gets little coverage sometimes because of the risk. And I came from that background where you become accused of legalism. Oh, you keep those laws because you have a legalistic approach. You're trying to earn your salvation through merit-based mechanisms. And I say, no, I am saved by grace through faith. But my response is complete surrender, complete obedience in the process of transformation into the image of Jesus. You know, Jesus says in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, if you really love me, you will keep my commandments. That was very important to Jesus. And this teaching is replicated throughout scriptures. The love of God, the Ten Commandments is our love for God, the first four, and the remaining six is love for fellow man. As simple as that. And in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, it's perpetuated right throughout the narrative what love looks like, what the moral law of God looks like. And I'm not talking just about compliance. I'm talking about willing obedience and see where you and I fit in the in the biblical mandate to completely surrender. And before I go there, and you think, well, you know, when should we wrestle with the subject's obedience? The one who set the highest example of obedience was Jesus himself. He his greatest act of obedience is on an unparalleled level because he 
obeyed his father's will and purpose at great personal cost and sacrifice and great suffering. If you spend time reading on the gospel accounts, including Luke, who came later, about Jesus' anguish and supplication and intense prayer before he died, before he was killed. He prays. And you know, John the Baptist introduces this Jesus three and a half years earlier. He says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came into this world as a purpose. Read the book of Revelation. He's also described as the Lamb of God. And he did it willingly. He obeyed his Father's command as he was the only one who could and would and should. And he laid his life down into the most brutal and torturous suffering in all of human history. And you and I today are redeemed, forgiven, cleansed and counted justified before our Heavenly Father because of Jesus, because of his shed blood. You know, the whole of the gospel message is one that points to liberty. It points to freedom. It points to eternal love, eternal life and love of the highest order. And I ask myself, what is my response to the sacrifice of Jesus and his anguish and suffering that preceded it? Because he willingly laid down his life. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. A glimpse of Gethsemane is given in Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. So God the Father heard Jesus' prayers, probably at Geth definitely at Gethsemane, but probably in the many other times that the disciples found Jesus going off in the wilderness by himself to pray. Verse 8, And although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And part of the Christian calling for you and I is that same path of suffering in this age to daily pick up our cross. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So under the terms of the new covenant, and the book of Hebrews elucidates the terms of the new covenant so clearly and so beautifully, there's no question that you and I are under the terms of the new covenant today now. And part of that new covenant call is obedience to follow Jesus and obey him just as he obeyed his father. Just as Jesus was intensely at one with his heavenly father, brothers and sisters, you and I are to be intensely one with one another in Christ, Christ in you and you in Christ, the oneness. So when you pray in Jesus' name, just like Jesus' prayer was heard by the father, our prayers are heard as well. How could Jesus do this at 33 and a half years of age? John 15, 13 is a preceding scripture that leads into this. He, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. We'll come back to that scripture in a minute. And that's what Jesus did. He calls you friend. Abraham was a friend of God. He's father of the faithful. And we follow also in Abraham's footsteps. Let's go back to Hebrews, a very favorite scripture of mine in chapter 12, verse 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What compelled Jesus to submit and obey his Father? There was goodness, reward, and great joy where many sons will be born to glory because of the preeminence of Jesus taking that faithful, fateful step as the Lamb of God, the sinless sacrifice to take on himself your sin and my sin and the sins of the world. And he did that willingly, though with great suffering and tears. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. You know, the preeminence of Jesus, if we really listen to Jesus' words, and like John, lean on his breast, walk by his side, pray in his name, 
you'll hear his words very powerfully. In John chapter 15, beginning in verse 10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So this keeping the commandments of Jesus, there's a love mechanism woven into that. And Jesus' love for his Father was manifest by his total obedience. Verse 11, These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Brothers and sisters, that's quite a call. This is a call to discipleship, a surrender, willing obedience, complete transformation. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So we have a response to that. What is your response to the love of Jesus, to the the brutal sacrifice that he went through? Six hours, nails in his feet and hands and ultimately spear in his side and a crown of thorns on his head and blood everywhere. Brothers and sisters, we have a response to God's saving grace. We are called to reflect authentic surrender and a deep and enduring faith. You know, it's easy to say, I believe. But what does real belief look like? It's easy to cerebrally say, yeah, I can see that's right and leave it on the shelf in a compartment. You know, we need more than just a one-time confession. You know, James says, I'll show you my faith by my works, the things that I do as a result of the saving grace given to me. I want to go back in time, well before the Mosaic Covenant. As I mentioned earlier, Abraham was a friend of God. He was the father of the faithful. And later on, towards the end of Abraham's life, God speaks to Isaac, because Abraham gave all his wealth and his legacy to Isaac. And in Genesis 26, verse 5, the Lord says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. And I remember reading that years ago and going, Really? I haven't heard the laws of God and commandments of God stipulated until Sinai. We're under the terms of the Old Covenant. The Ten Commandments became under the mercy seat, in the Ark of the Covenant, held a very special place. And so you realize that long before the Mosaic Sinaitic Covenant, godly faithful people lived and knew the commandments and the laws and the heart of God. And, um, and you know, we could say, oh, well, Moses wrote that because he was associated with the giving of the law. Well, the Spirit inspired the Scriptures to tell us what was on Abraham's heart, and that he found favor with God just like Noah did because there was something God could work with, a willing heart, a willing to obey. God says to Abraham, well, get out of the land in which you live and go and live in tents, so to speak, and I'll give you an inheritance. And Abraham just gets up and go, goes. Brothers and sisters, We must be very careful because I see in the broader Christian landscape beguiling theology that minimizes obedience and puts a licentious grace in its place. And that undermines total obedience and complete surrender because you can still have your own life in this world and God is... A nice compartment. It's a good compartment. It's a very good thing. I don't disagree with it. But I haven't totally surrendered to it. And I talk to many Christians and not all openly confess the words of Jesus in their spontaneous dialogue. I'll talk about sport. We'll talk about cricket. We'll talk about the weather. We'll talk about all kinds of things. And I try to steer the conversation um, towards the higher ideal of the transcendent, knowable, lovable. And sometimes it falls on flat ears. Okay, let's say people are still not there yet. We're all works in progress in the master's hands. But we recognize that law and its consequences are essential to a civil society. 
And I want to use an example where a suburban street limit is 50 kilometres an hour. A more open road is about 70 or 80 kilometres an hour. And here in Western Australia, the highway speed is 110 kilometres an hour, which is about 65 miles an hour in American. And, and we recognise... We recognise that those laws are essential in traffic governance for the safety of pedestrians to contain noise and the safety of other traffic. And when a car accident happens, you realise, well, what happened? Who did wrong in that case, you see? And we all recognise that those traffic laws, and I'm using that as an example, serve a particular good purpose. And if we break them, if I drive my fast muscle car over the speed limit, I will face the consequences either a ticket from the police or I'll cause some irreparable damage. And there's the obedience to those laws are indisputable. Apostle Paul talks about even the Gentiles, in that those who are unconverted, don't know God, still have an appreciation by conscience that law exists and they are compliant or obedient to those laws. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and those who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are the law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that their work the work of the law is written in their hearts, and their conscience also bears witness. So you have the forming of civilized society that has law governing behavior and creating boundaries of what's permissible. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On the day when, in verse 16, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. You know, for us today, as a part of the body of Christ, the law of God, the call to obedience throughout Scripture has never been diminished. You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, I was only reading that the other day, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. That's Jesus' words. He didn't come to do away with the law, he came to fulfill the law. And he was so obedient to his father to the point of blood, shedding his blood. And you and I have never obeyed to the point of shedding our blood. We don't need to. We cannot do what Jesus did. That's why Jesus is always preeminent. He is the lawgiver. You know, you talk about Abraham and the heart of Abraham in obeying all God's laws and commandments and judges and statutes. You know, you find that in David as well. And I was only reflecting on the Psalms 19, beginning in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. I love the word of God. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Our response to the freedom of salvation in Christ and the free gift of righteousness in Christ is a tangible response of complete and total surrender, willing obedience on the journey to transformation. There is great reward. Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to each one according to what he has done. In the same book of Revelation, we read a definition of the saints in two places. In Revelation 14, 12, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. And what are the saints? Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. We are a Bible-based church, Christ-centered, spirit-led, and Sabbath-celebrating. And somewhere there we could put commandment-obeying. We keep the commandments of God. We uphold the law of God in its beauty, in its integrity. 
As Paul says, I wouldn't have known what sin is except by the law that said, you shall not covet. And covet, out of all the Ten Commandments, especially in the last six that relate to relationships, is what is happening in the mind and what is happening in the heart that predicates murder, adultery, lies and other sins. You know, we are saved by grace through faith, as Apostle Paul so well says, and we are called to completely surrender. I love the hymn, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender, I surrender all. But it's very easy to sing. It's much more difficult to put into practice and to live completely obedient and experience what this ongoing transformation is we are, Christ is being formed in us. You know, Jesus Christ obeyed his heavenly Father in an act of obedience that for all of history will forever honour. That's why Jesus is forever preeminent. He now sits on his Father's throne. And you and I invited to join Jesus on his throne. The reward is great, the stakes are high, and the calling noble. Don't let anybody take you away from the word of God and his law and his commandments. It calls for total surrender. You know, you want to see tangible evidence of this, and we gain glimpses of it. Peter received a vision from heaven that he found confusing, and he walks away wondering what it means. And his response to the vision was, is I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. So what was the predicating laws or the obedience that made Peter not eat unclean food? We realised the vision was about the Gentiles in Cornelius' house and we follow the story through. Because Peter had been with Jesus and he'd never seen Jesus eat a bacon or shellfish sandwich. I'm being a bit simplistic, but I am see things in black and white. You know, Peter loved the Lord. He threw himself into the Lord. He said, I will die with you. He didn't realize what a weak man he was in denying Jesus. But on the day of Pentecost, with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, we see the transformed Peter, speaking out boldly and counting it joy to suffer for the name of Jesus. And brothers and sisters, that's our calling as well. May we never fall then into the trap of doing the bare minimum. I know my wife works at a, with a company where a percentage of the staff there just do the bare minimum. And she finds it psychologically deplorable and hard because within the body of Christ, as Christ followers, you throw yourself 100% into the task of the moment. And yet there are people who are victims, entitled, whatever you call them, carry with them just this bare minimum mentality. You know, Jesus told a parable along those lines, Luke chapter 17, verse 10. So you also, when you've done all that were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. Brothers and sisters, allow the call of God, the law of the Lord, to take us to Jesus Christ. Our obedience brings us to Jesus in a very powerful way because Jesus is the lawgiver. And because he was the lawgiver, he could also be the Lamb of God to take away the sin in the redemptive process that you and I are justified, sanctified and consecrated for a holy life. We're talking about total surrender, willing obedience, complete transformation that leads to ultimate glory.